Hi folks, uh, thanks for joining in. I uh, hope you are doing great and uh, most importantly staying safe. I am Prabhas Srivadhana from WSO2 and this is our 36th Silicon Valley IA meetup. Uh, today we have Lorenzo Sprika uh, to talk about uh, the new Spring Security Authorization Server project. Uh, so Lorenzo is the author of uh, this book, uh, Spring Security in Action, uh, which was released uh, last month. Uh, in fact, uh, this book is the one that triggered uh, us to uh, have this meetup. He's also a contributor to the uh, Spring Security Authorization Server project. Uh, so with that, uh, I'll hand over to Lorenzo. Uh, over to you. Super. Thank you very much. Uh, so thank you everyone for attending this presentation. We'll discuss the Spring Security Experimental Authorization Server. Why is this project needed? How did it appear? And of course, some things about OAuth 2 and OpenID Connect uh, on the way. Uh, and I hope you'll enjoy the presentation, of course. Um, and uh, let's start with the first, first of all, a refresher on what OAuth 2 is and um, discuss a little bit about the grant types and a little bit about the components that are part of an um, OAuth 2 uh, system. And then let's see where does the new Spring Security Experimental Authorization Server fit. And besides some slides today, I, I will also show you some code and we'll discuss a little bit on what has been already implemented up to now. Uh, the Spin Security Experimental Authorization Server is at version 003. So it's, it's called experimental, that's the zero as a major version. Uh, and uh, it's probably uh, quite some time since I've seen a zero as a major, major version for a spring project or for any, any project of the Spring ecosystem in general. So it's quite uh, nice to see um, something like this happening today. But uh, in the end, uh, maybe a few months, maybe one year from now on, we'll have a fully um, working ex uh, authorization server and it won't be experimental anymore. And that's when we will gonna use this um, new project of the Spring um, uh, ecosystem to build our own authorization server uh, which uh, for the moment we can only do with the Spring Security OAuth project. Um, for those of you who are not aware, uh, it has been declared as deprecated some months ago. And unfortunately for the authorization server, there is no replacement. And that, that's where we are gonna see the need of a new uh, authorization server. And that's why, this, why we discuss this now. So as I uh, said from the very beginning, let's start with an, a refresher, a short refresher on what is OAuth 2 and when shall we use it? And um, I won't go through all the details about OAuth 2 and OpenID Connect, of course, because uh, we would need more than one hour for that. Actually, I think I, I can speak for more than one week about this subject and still still won't finish. Uh, but I want you want want you at least to be aware of the components we discuss and the place again where the authorization server fits in the OAuth 2 system because we discuss about the authorization server and we need to know and I need I need to make sure that you all remember uh, uh, or learn where the Spin Security authorization where the authorization server fits in a, in an OAuth 2 system so that when we discuss the Spin Security authorization server you know where it fits in the system, of course. So in terms of OAuth 2, we say that's not an authorization specification framework. Some, uh, in some of the cases, you'll find it re referred as an authentication framework as well. Um, it's official definition, it's an authorization framework because theoretically it doesn't interfere with authentication. But of course, in order to have authorization, you need to first to have an authentication and the authentication is done at the authorization server level where um, the user needs to authenticate or the client, depending on the grant type we use, you will see a little bit later in one of the next slides uh, and get the client gets back a token uh, to be able to then authenticate and get uh, privileges uh, to use resources that are exposed and protected by a resource server. Uh, in the OAuth 2, we use specific flows that we name grant types. They are flows in which a client obtains tokens from um, the authorization server. And depending on the grant type you use, you have a specific flow to obtain the access token. We call an access token, that token that's used by the client then to obtain uh, access to use a specific resource at the resource server side. 
Uh, and of course, we need to be aware of the fact that in case of all two, the authentication and authorization responsibilities are separated and they are defined by two different components of the system. So if we go further a little bit in the um, in an OAuth 2 system, just to see the actors that communicate one to the other, you have here the user, and then in the middle here, it's represented, it's the client, it's in this case, represented by a browser, but uh, I don't necessarily, um, I, I don't want to, to just say it's necessarily a browser, it can be, for example, a mobile application, it can be a desk desktop application, it can even be a different server component, the microservice that uses it. I'm just placing it as a browser because it's easier for you to, and I, in my experience, for my students at least, it's easier to imagine it like this. So you have the user and the user needs to um, see some data uh, that's displayed by the client. In, in this case, say it's a web application. So the client needs to get the data from this nice server here, which is represented with an R and a different color. And this is called the resource server. The resource server being actually the protected backend, the, the backend of the protected application. So you know, this is where the resources are protected, stored. And in terms of resources here, we refer to data, data that belongs to the user, data that can be either accessed, either changed. Uh, and the resource server wants to be sure that it allows the data to be changed or accessed only by uh, those uh, clients that have the privilege and only of course by the users uh, that have the privilege to access that data. And in order to make sure that only those clients slash users access the data, uh, it validates that the request has a specific access token. So the client first needs to get an access token to prove that they uh, were allowed by a specific user or that they have a specific permissions to access some resources. Uh, and looking at access token, they uh, get it from this nice A black represented server above called the authorization server whose responsibility is to manage the, the user. So this is a very, very top of the mountain picture of how um, an OAuth 2 system looks like and the actors in an OAuth 2 system. And again, very important in terms at least of the authorization server, and maybe, maybe I can say in terms of OAuth 2 systems in general is to understand that we have specific flows in which the client obtains tokens. So uh, we call them grant types again. That's what I said at the very beginning from the first slide. And we have different defined in the specification, different defined grant types. And those that are mostly encountered in applications and especially in Spring applications and, and those that Spring security um, provided up to now are the implicit grant type. You will see this is marked as deprecated and you shouldn't use this one anymore uh, because it's considered vulnerable. Uh, and you have, we have the authorization code grant type. This took place, this took the place of the implicit grant type. Uh, and in general, we can use it, in, uh, we, we can use it in a, a standard fashion, but we can also use it with something that's called Pixie, uh, which is a way in which we make the flow a little bit more secure to avoid using what we call client credentials. And you will see avoid some kind of uh, glitch in the flow where an attacker could actually obtain some authorization code in order to get its own access token. So to actually go um, beyond the, the uh, security we implement and access resources um, that uh, it shouldn't have access to. Uh, and we have the password run type. This is uh, one, uh, this is one that uh, usually you have to be very careful with because in the case of the password grant type, uh, the client uses, shares the credentials with the user. So that actually means um, the uh, client knows at some point which are the user's credentials. And uh, that's fine as long as you have a client that's part of the same organization with the authorization server. But if say you implement something like 
you authenticate through GitHub or I know something like this, some other kind of social network or uh, and in this case, of course, nobody, no, no authorization server will support the password grant type because, well, of course, uh, GitHub doesn't want you to know and to be able to obtain their users' credentials because you can do whatever you want with them afterwards and you, you might not protect them, them even if you don't want to use them maliciously. So this is not quite a very often encountered grant, uh, grant type in this case. It's most often that with users, you use the authorization code and the authorization code with Pixie nowadays. Um, we have, of course, the client credentials and that's used in the case in which you don't have a user. There are situations in which a client, which is the application uh, that wants to get data from a server, we call in this situation, the resource server, um, needs to, to obtain those the details without having the approval of a user. Uh, in some cases, there is not user data. They, they, there is not the user data they, they want to retrieve. And in this case, of course, they don't need to, to get an authorized, um, authorization first from a specific user. Let me give you an example. Today, very often in systems, we, uh, we deploy our microservices. We have microservices and we deploy them with Kubernetes or some other orchestration tool, but Kubernetes is very, very uh, often encountered today in um, application deployments and especially microservices deployments. And of course, uh, OAuth 2 systems are very often OAuth 2 authorization and authentication are uh, very often um, uh, encountered today with microservices. Uh, in case of Kubernetes, for those of you who might be aware, uh, Kubernetes is an orchestration tool. So it takes care of uh, spinning up and down containers with your microservices, but it does more than that. Uh, one of the common features you do with Kubernetes is to implement uh, some health checks. Um, some, they are called the live net, liveness probes, the readiness and the liveness probes. Uh, these probes, they, they simply call your application to make sure that it's still alive. And in case it's not alive, restart the container or decouple it from the load balancer, depending on how you configure it. Uh, it's not the purpose of the, today's presentation, of course, how you can configure Kubernetes. But what I, want you to, what, what I wanted to say here is that in this case, Kubernetes, to test your application, it needs to call an endpoint, isn't it? So it needs to, need, needs to call an endpoint. That actually means it needs to access a resource on the resource server. Uh, it needs to access that resource on the resource server. It needs to um, uh, call to make sure that the application is alive. But it doesn't need a user to allow Kubernetes to do that because it's only uh, the orchestration tool calling an endpoint on your application to make sure it's still alive. Uh, in this case, you would use a creden client credentials grant type, which uh, uh, offers the client the possibility, the client being in our case, Kubernetes, the possibility to call a specific resource like an endpoint without needing the approval of a user. So the client, that's, called, that's why it's called the client credentials, because in this case, the client actually uses its own credentials uh, to access a specific resource. And we have the last of all, and that's, that's I'm, when, when I'm, I will be uh, over with uh, the refresher on um, uh, the OAuth 2, and then we go deep into, into the new experimental authorization server, the refresh token, which is uh, again, one of the most common uh, grant types used to, uh, for, by a client to obtain a new access token when, when it already got one without using the user's credentials. Um, for, out of this, up to now in version 0.0.3 of the new experimental authorization server, we only have implemented the authorization code grant type with and without Pixie. We have the client credentials and we have the refresh token. So the password and the implicit grant type, they are not supported yet. The password will be probably, I'm not sure about the implicit grant type because it's already deprecated. Uh, it might be implemented, but I'm sure it's less of a concern for the moment. But what we could use now, for example, is the authorization code, a client credentials and the refresh token. And up to version 003, you already have those implemented. 
uh, which is not a problem because uh, maybe I, I should have specified, but I didn't. It's it's called experimental because you shouldn't use it in production yet. <laughs> but I, I, I guess that that was uh, uh, already what what you was uh, were thinking uh, uh, about uh, that you shouldn't actually use this in production yet. Uh, so it, uh, up to the point where we have we have a major version greater than zero, I wouldn't recommend you use something like this in a production ready application. Um, so yeah, uh, and... shall, shall I take a yes. one question? Uh, sure. So it's a comment, in fact, from Eric. Uh, so a resource owner password. Uh, it's okay to use in uh, first party apps, but it's not recommended anymore. Uh, do you have any? comments on that i think it's a comment uh, uh resource can can you can you repeat please because i didn't yeah. understand which one so it's a comment uh, says uh, resource on a password it is okay to use in uh, first party apps uh, but it's uh, not recommended anymore yeah it's not recommended i agree with that that's why i said you that, that that doesn't mean you won't find it in real world example in real world scenarios even in productions examples uh, because once, believe me, once you use something, uh, developers and teams tend to leave it there. And even if it's not recommended, I doubt that a lot of, of, de of developers in projects that where that already exists have taken it out. Uh, but I personally don't, uh, don't recommend using the password the grant type. And I would go with authorization code. And if possible, I'll go with the authorization code with Pixie. Password grant type is not yet, is not considered deprecated as the implicit one, but is not recommended. Uh, and um, uh, one more thing, you will use it, you will still see it very often in um, examples, in, uh, in POCs, uh, and in theoretical examples, just because it's much easier to use the password grant type when you simply just use to uh, get an access token to test, for example, a user detail service and so on. You don't want to go up and uh, here and there. See, this is the uh, next slide. What I wanted to show you is the, the flow for the uh, authorization code grant type, where you have to first obtain an access token and then, uh, uh, when uh, sorry, an authorization code. And then, then after you obtain the authorization code, you get the access token. So you, you go uh, up to uh, the browser, uh, logging in, and then getting the authorization code, and then using the authorization code to get an access token. People in examples tend to make it easier, and using the password grant type, they, they do use that only to simplify their examples. And, and I do that scene sometimes myself, but it's just because you spare, you spare time if you do that instead of using authorization code. I hope I answered you the question, Eric. Yes, and I Eric. think in, in over 2.1 specification, uh, it has removed both uh, implicit grant type and uh, password grant type, both being removed from 2.1 spec. Upcoming it, spec. It's possible. I, I don't, I, I can't say I'm uh, uh, memorizing or, or learning them by heart. So it's, it's very possible. Anyway, the point is clear. It's, it's very true what you said, and indeed, password grant type, I would uh, not recommend using it. So go for the authorization code and the authorization code with Pixie, if yeah. possible. Super. And then, yeah, just for you to see here a very, very simple flow to remember it or, or to, to learn it now in case you didn't see how the um, authorization code grant type looks like. Uh, here, it's the user wants the, the user wants to access some resources to see them like uh, they want to see this, their accounts, whatever that is, and the client should display them. And in order to do that, what does the client do? It redirects the user to a page or a functionality on the authorization server where the user needs to specify uh, uh, to, to specify to enter their credentials and prove who they are. Uh, and uh, once it does that, say the authentication went correctly, then uh, the authorization server redirects back the user to, to the client. It's a redirect URI that's used here by the authorization server uh, in the browser to redirect it to a specific URL uh, with the uh, authorization code. So it provides through the redirect when redirecting to that 
that specific uh, URL that you specify, it also provides the authorization code. And the authorization code is then used by uh, the client to uh, obtain the access token. You will see me doing this immediately, so I don't have to go into a lot of details. Now, before going into code, uh, I also want to tell you a little bit the story of, of why was it needed to create this authorization server project because some of you might know that we already have the possibility to implement an authorization server now clearly not directly with spring security but using the spring security auth project that's part of the spring ecosystem as well and the idea is that the spring security auth has been deprecated. It's actually a little bit of a dark story, but well, of course not this dark story for this, but the idea is that after making the Spring Security Wealth project deprecated, many uh, in the community ask themselves, is this legacy or not? Because of course de deprecated, is, it doesn't necessarily mean legacy. Uh, why? Because now if you try to find it out there, and believe me, I'm a, I'm a software consultant. I'm actually a Java consultant and I, I see a lot of projects and I can't, I can't count now how many projects I've seen in the last months uh, and how many projects I've seen using the Spring Security Wolf project still and how many projects I've seen, well, not that many, but I've seen a couple of projects at least in the, in the, few month, in the past few, mo few months that uh, are using Spring Security Wolf to implement their uh, authorization server. So it's not that you make it deprecated and suddenly nobody use it, uses it anymore. It will be used. And one of the, the advice, please take, take, take this advice from me. If you learn Spring Security now, learn also the Spring Security OAuth project. I, I put it in my book uh, together with the new fashion of uh, uh, implementing uh, the uh, resource server. And uh, when, when the time comes uh, next year or when, when this uh, new uh, experimental authorization server will be ready. I will also write a second edition of the book to make sure that it's complete with what's new. But I also uh, added in my book uh, knowledge about Spring Security of our project because I know that five, maybe 10 years from now on, you might still have the chance to find it in existing applications. So I, that, that's why I always say, and, and I, I advise everybody, do learn this one as well because it will be helpful at some point, it's not a big deal. Anyway, if you know what OAuth 2 is and how it works and OpenID Connect, then it's, it's fine enough already and you will find your way uh, in both of the projects, the legacy and the not legacy one. But the idea is that now what happens is that we have a possibility to replace almost everything from Spring Security OAuth aside from the authorization server. So you can now use Spring Security to implement your resource server configurations and your client configurations, but not the authorization server. So that's where the experimental authorization server comes into action. That's where it, uh, it starts to being dev developed to actually being able to say we can completely replace in term of, terms of functionality, the legacy or not Spring Security of our project. And let's do a little bit of hands-on now because that's basically what I wanted to do as a refresher. And here, what you see on my screen now, uh, what I'm sharing, it's basically just my fork on the Spring Security Authorization Project uh, because I, I've told you that I'm also contributing to it either by testing or implementing um, new uh, features or by, by solving bugs. And I do recommend you uh, do that as well if you have the time. Uh, and anytime, uh, uh, if you don't already contribute to, a, to an open source project, uh, my advice is go and choose a project, whatever project, whatever open source project is, from Spring or not, uh, it's always good and helpful for the community and it will be helpful for you at some point to help with contributing for an open source project. I'm contributing today. Uh, uh, on this uh, on this project, uh, and uh, I sometimes change the project, and that that's this one. I'm, I'm I've been just starting to contribute to it from from its very beginning, but uh, it's not the only one I've uh, I've been contributing to. Uh, now, what you see here is that uh, the project itself, well, it has the project, but it also which is not not a huge one. 
Uh, and I'm not going to, to discuss deeply now the design of it because it might change. It's only experimental, it's only version 003. But I, I would like to actually show you rather the sample where you will see how an authorization server can be built and we can even make a test to see how it's working. And I think that's, that's a little bit, uh, um, say, more um, interesting for you. Let's make our life a little bit easier. Call this a client. Let's call this read just to write a little bit less. And um, you see here we are using, we can use for now only the authorization code, refresh token and client credentials. Let's actually comment this out and say, we only want to see the authorization code. And if you want to see a refresh token as well, then we need to add the refresh token grant type. Let me explain you a little bit what's here in this class. Usually, usually I'm writing it myself, the class in front of everyone. But now I, I've chosen just to open this, uh, this already project. I already have cloned it here. First of all, for those of you who are aware about Spring Security, they might know that the user detail service is the contract in Spring Security that uh, represents uh, uh, the responsibility of obtaining the user details from somewhere. So for example, if you'd like to have users in a database, you can anytime implement this interface, which only has one method, uh, load user by username, implement this method and say, how is the uh, user details obtained from, uh, from uh, uh, your database by the username. Of course, you can anytime use also one of the uh, implementations Spring Security provides like the JDBC user details manager, but I'm not going into details now. The idea is you still need a user details service. Why? Because as I've told you a little bit earlier in the presentation, the authorization server uh, is used to authenticate the user. So in order to authenticate the user, it, it needs to know how to grab the user details. And you will actually implement this functionality the same way you do for any Spring Security application, being it a no auth authorization server or not. You will define a user details service. In this, of course, sample, we have an in-memory user details manager that we are using as our user details service. So we will have this user one with password and with the role user that we can use. Uh, so that's that's one of the, the important things. Um, uh, this is, this is for the uh, end user authentication, right? Uh, is it for the end user authentication, right? Uh, yes, for the end user authentication, yes, precisely. Oh. So and for uh, the client authentication, uh, is it uh, the client authentication methods? Is it pluggable? Like other than basic code, uh, can we also use like X five and certificates? Uh, those things for the client, or it's just a client identity, client secret. So for the client, you have a very similar uh, contract like the user detail service. But now I was just going to show it uh, because in this sample, it's separated into another configuration class. For the client, you have the registered client repository. And the registered client repository, it has a couple of methods. It's the find by ID and find by client ID. So you have to implement this to, to tell your authorization server where to get the client details from. So the, so the client this details. This is a new interface uh, added with a new project? Yes, or? this one. this one is a new interface. Uh, and uh, for those of you who are aware of using the Spring Security OAuth project, this is quite similar to what the client detail service is for the Spring Security OAuth. So it's, something similar was there as well, but it was called the client detail service in case you've used that. Okay. But this is a new contract, okay? And again, a new contract, the registered client is the contract, the interface it's, it's a class now, but I guess that we, they will make it an interface uh, representing the, the client. And of course, in a real world scenario, the clients will be also somewhere managed in a database or whatever fashion you'd like for, for your client. In this case, it's just in memory, but in a real world scenario, you would have it somewhere um, managed the same as the users. So you would, you would have a database or something where you, you keep all these details. Um, and you need this, this couple of bins, one for the management of the users, the second one for the management of the clients. And then we have this, uh, this bin uh, representing uh, the, um, I would call it like the manager of the keys 
uh, because for the moment in this uh, authorization server up to version 003, uh, people, the developers focused on implementing the JWT feature, so non-opaque tokens. They didn't uh, implement opaque tokens yet. So again, I don't want to go in details with this one because it, it will probably change when we get also opaque and non-opaque tokens. Um, but that's basically uh, what our project uses to sign the JWT tokens. That's why we need this one here in case you are wondering. But I, I guess the most important things being here are the management of the users, which keeps the same uh, with the user detail service, which is a contract from the very first version of Spin Security. Uh, and this new contract that appears in the experimental authorization server called the Register Client Repository, being very similar, as I've said, um, with what the client detail service is in the case of the Spring Security OAuth project. And what you see here, what you see me doing here is uh, that, of course, for the client, you need to specify some details like the client ID and the client secret. Um, this is the registration ID. Uh, you have a registration ID and then you have, of course, the credentials which are separate, the client ID and the client secret. Uh, this authentication method is to tell you how you authenticate against the token endpoint. When you call the token endpoint, you can use the basic authentication or you can even choose to have no authentication. Uh, that's HTTP basic, of course. Uh, the grant types you wish to use. One important thing to specify in case you use Pixie, uh, you don't need to specify a client secret. I won't go into Pixie now because that would mean I need to generate my client verifier and client ch challenge, uh, which takes me some more work to do. But uh, what I wanted to tell you is that uh, version 003 already supports Pixie as well. So you can use now for the authorization code grant type, you can go with the authentication, direct authentication with client ID and secret. But if you want, you can go with using Pixie as well, which is uh, um, using for the call, a challenge and the verifier for the obtaining uh, the uh, authorization code and using uh, the uh, authorization code. And that's for, of course, making sure that the client who uh, authenticated is the same uh, with the one who got the authorization code, uh, because that's the flow. That's where, 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 where Pixie comes into action, because if you don't have it, you can't be sure that uh, that the the uh, real client got the uh, the authorization code, uh, so it's a kind of enforcing a little bit the the flow, uh, and you can use it with version 003. And then of course, if you use the authorization code, you need the redirect URI. You've seen from my presentation the server uh, redirects uh, the client to this redirect URI uh, in order to provide the authorization code. You need the scopes, you can have, let's just have one scope, it's enough for us. And then we have some settings, the, the client and the token settings, they are set up like this, but uh, again, it's, it's not, I don't think it's, it's uh, um, now we needed to go into details because these are things that, that can change in time. I, I even changed it one just in this, this month. So- uh, And we, we uh, can add multiple uh, redirect URIs too, right? Is it? Multiple, sorry? Multiple uh, redirect URIs. Uh... Oh yes, uh, you can you can use uh, multiple redirect URIs. Basically, that's from the specification. Okay. And uh, what what happens uh, is that uh, to to tell you uh, how how things are going in the development of the project, we are basically just referring on the RFCs. So we we just try to make it as well as possible according to the RFC. Uh, and if I remember correctly, the, the RFC uh, um, allows for multiple redirect yeah, URIs. Yeah. Yeah. So, so uh, um, I, I, I can't say I tested it, but I will after you, you asked me this because I, I, I forgot to test this, but I'm pretty sure it was already implemented to use multiple redirect URIs as well. And if it, if it wasn't, it will be up to, to the first major version. So I'm pretty sure because it has to fulfill the, 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 the specification. Uh, and let's let's actually try to run it. Um, so let's try to run this sample and see if it's working. I'm not sure why is this so slow today. 
that's usually usually starting faster. Or maybe it already got started, but I don't see the output. Let, let me just test. So we chose the port that we were using for this. Let me check. So we are using port 9000. So I was already actually probably testing it earlier. No, the application didn't start. I will try to start it again. So run. Oh, it's still building. Okay. And started. And now let's go just to, to make uh, some tests on the endpoints that we already have implemented in this version 003. I, I actually have here a little bit more than version 003 because I'm on the master branch and some of the issues for version 010, which is the next one, have already been merged. Uh, so some of these things you will see in the next version. Uh, but uh, here you can all already see it's very similar to what you were used to when using the uh, Spring Security OAuth. You see all the patterns for the endpoints that are exposed. So you have the authorized endpoint that you use in the authorization code, the uh, grant type to uh, get the user authorized. So is that endpoint to where you redirect the user uh, to, to authenticate. Uh, and then you have the token endpoint, of course, that you use to get a token. You have a revocation uh, endpoint. Uh, the uh, revocation of the both access token and refresh token have been implemented in, uh, in this um, uh, version of uh, the experimental authorization server. Uh, we have the JWK uh, keys uh, token, so the certificates token, uh, the, the certificates endpoint, sorry. Uh, and uh, the open ID configuration endpoint has been uh, as well added, but this, this I think is not part of 003. I think this is one of the features that has been added for 010. I didn't test it yet. Um, so um, to test it, you either get the master from, um, from the repo or you wait for the January, for January to get the 010 version. Um, and yeah, if I'm going... So yes. this would uh, this this new interface will uh, replace this client detail service configurer in the uh, previous project. Uh, so we used to. I was just checking uh, my previous code uh, that we have written in in our book. Uh, okay. So when you build the authorization server, we use uh, we extended the yes. authorization server configurer adapter. And then uh, we set up the uh, client details uh, service configurer and set the yes, same yes, thing yes. Did, like grant types, those stuff. Yes, precisely what you see in Spring Security in action is basically what we have now that's the Spring Security OAuth project. So the this full project, its purpose is to in the end replace that way and with that making the, making it completely deprecated. Okay. Because now you cannot, with Spring Security, you cannot implement uh, an authorization server other way than what you've seen in Spring Security in action, which is the Spring Security OAuth project. Yeah. Uh, and the purpose of this project is to not only replace, but even make it better, make better the Spring Security, the Spring Security authorization server. Okay. And at some point that will replace what you see in, I think it's chapter uh, chapter 12 or uh, 12 to 15 is the OAuth part of Spring Security in action. Uh, and uh, that, that one in, will probably be replaced in my book in, in, in the, the second edition as well, of course. <laughs> when yeah, this one will be out. Another question from Alan. Uh, why is there a scope on the client? Isn't that part of the authorization token? I guess that's the supported scopes, right? Oh, no, for, for obtaining uh, is, is that the scope is not uh, part of the, it, it will be in the token, of course, in case you use a non opaque token, but to get it on the token, you uh, get it from the client because, because when you request, when you request the token, you request the token for a specific scope and the scope is of the client. Yeah, so, so I think, uh, his question is, uh, so you, when you register the client, uh, we regi you, you add the scopes too. So basically uh, those are the scopes allowed for that particular client. For that client, yeah, precisely. Okay. Yeah, that's, that's what we do there. So when, when I uh, register the client, in, again, in a production ready application, this would basically be in a database. You might have as many scopes as you would like. 
and the scopes are those that are allowed for this client. So this is what you will use to obtain the access token in the end. And if you remove that, uh, the client will be able to uh, get access token for any scope it requests. Is that how it works? So uh, I'm not sure. I can't answer this question. I don't remember precisely. And I'm not sure. I, I didn't even test it and neither read it in the documentation. Okay. So I'm not sure. Yeah, I, I, I'm not sure if this is how it works or it might be that even with this implementation, it won't be able to access. I will, I will test it, this as well. <laughs> Got it, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So if you, for example, call the JWKS endpoint, you will of course see something very similar to what you used to see for any authorization server. So for example, if you use a third party uh, authorization server like uh, Keycloak or Okta, you have something similar. It's that endpoint that you, uh, if you'd like to configure on your resource server to use uh, an asymmetric key, uh, uh, con uh, key, uh, key uh, pair configuration to use uh, the public key it obtains here to validate, of course, a specific token it gets. You, you might have seen this um, already, if not, this is basically providing the resource server with the public key part for a specific token that's represented by a specific key ID. The key ID, you see it here. So in case a resource server gets a token, it finds this key ID in the header of the token, and then it gets the public key, and it uses the public key to validate that the token was indeed not altered on its way to the resource server that it's an authentic token. And let's say we want to, uh, actually we want, we want to test uh, this uh, authorization uh, code flow, at least at least one flow. Let's, let's try to test the authorization code flow. So I have a browser here with me. And if, I'm, um, uh, if, if I want to test the authorization code flow, the first thing a client does is redirecting me the user to the authorization server to authenticate. It's like in my, my diagram here, you've seen, when I try to access, I'm redirected to a login on the authorization server. And to do that, we use the authorize endpoint. So in my case, I should say here, localhost 9000 was the port if I correctly remember. And here I already have some call, something, some, some uh, previous call of mine. Uh, 9000 allows to authorize response type code because I want to be, uh, I, I want to use the authorization code run type. Uh, client ID client scope read. So I need to request for a specific client and of course one of the scopes. And then I'm redirected on my authorization server to log in. And I need to use uh, a valid user. And I, I forgot my valid user, so I have to check it here in the configuration, user one with password. So it's one of the users, of course, known by the authorization server. So it's user one and password. And I sign in and say, I uh, sign in with a valid uh, user, what I did. My consent is required. I submit the consent and then I'm redirected on the redirect URI with this is the authorization code what you see here so that that this huge code here is the authorization code you can see that i've been redirected to localhost 8080 authorized that should be exactly the uri you placed here see so that's why i mean of course i don't have this uri anywhere that's why you see a 404 forbid uh, 404 not found but uh, uh, it, I don't really care because now I copied the authorization code and I will, co I will complete the rest of the flow from my postman. And from the postman, the rest of the flow is once you have an authorization code, you obtain the access token. How do you obtain the access token? You call the token endpoint, which is a post HTTP method. And you specify, you say, I'd like to use the authorization code run type and then of, of course you use the value of the code and because here i specify that i have to authenticate with http basic and i'm not using pixie then uh, i have here to use the client and secret according to my credentials of the client so then i have all the needed headers and the authorization 
uh, sorry, parameters and the authorization. And then I can send. And if everything is correct, I will get back a 200 OK. And I get the access token. And of course, I get also a refresh token because I, I, I had yet the refresh token ground type as well in my configuration. So that, now I can even use the refresh token to get a new access token. If you take a look here inside the access token, my favorite is going to JWTIO. And then I paste my token here. Uh, based my token here. Uh, the version of the token, of course, is by default, it is base64 encoded. And here you see the base64 decoded version. What I wanted you to see, first of all, the key ID is in the header. This is exactly, so 32A07, blah, 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 blah. This is exactly the key ID you've seen here when I call the certificates endpoint. That means that indeed, this token has been signed with the private part of this pair, and this is the public key. So if, I, if I'd like, I can use this public key to validate that the token is correct. I, I could use this one. Uh, and then the second thing I'd like, you to, I'd, I'd like you to see is the details you get in the token. For the moment, I don't think you can customize the token, unfortunately, up to version 003, but that for sure will be one of the next things you uh, we, we will implement. And for sure, it will be one of the things we have to implement up to, up, up to the first major version. But here now, this is how it looks like. You see it's user one, which is the user for which I issue the token is client. The scope, of course, uh, the expiration uh, date, which is one hour, I think now just static one hour after, if I remember correctly. Uh, and of course, an identifier, a unique identifier. So that's uh, that's how my token looks like. And now, now I, I, I have actually proved the simplest authorization code uh, grant type in uh, in the new authorization server project. That's that's basically so this uh, JWT access token. Uh, it, is it uh, is it according uh, comply with the uh, this JWT profile for two access token or it's a JWT that uh, you design? It's a new a new RFC coming up in the. Uh, Oath working group, uh, JWT profile for O2 access tokens. So let me see. You asked me if the JWT is something that that uh, is now uh, created inside, or we use a dependency to build that. Yeah, the uh, the access token, the JWT that you create, uh, it's it's according to the uh, this JWT profile uh, uh, O2 access token, or it's it's done before that. Uh, I'm uh, not sure if that was already taken into consideration. That's because if I remember correctly, uh, this month, uh, the OpenID Connect is in progress. Uh, and I think there are some, some uh, features that uh, are not part of the backlog yet. OK. So you, do, so do you have this project in, that... sorry, you have project, this project in GitHub or somewhere? Uh, yeah, sure, sure. So you can, it's, it's, it's an open source, uh, you can contribute to it. Uh, a lot of developers already contribute to it. Let me find it. Actually, I'm, I will be going through my, through my GitHub because I don't, I don't know by the address by heart. So I, I, I'm, I'll be going, not this one. This is my, uh, my own GitHub. But I, I will be going to my fork. And here it is. So it's Spring, Secu Spring Project Experimental, Spring Security Authorization Server. This is where you can fork it from. And after you fork it, you can start contributing. And you see here the, the, uh, the documentation of how to get started on working of the, on, on the open source project. Uh, we are using a Zenboard to collaborate, uh, a Zenboard tool. The link should be somewhere here as well. Um, so the yeah. Spring Security O2 module, so there's no progress in that, is it? It's, it's going to be deprecated there. The Spring Security O2. Yeah. Yeah, uh, that, that one, it's already deprecated actually. Okay. But the problem is that, yeah, that, that's why I said in the very beginning of the presentation, it's already deprecated, but is it legacy or not? Because now you cannot actually do use something else to implement the authorization server. And that's, that's the goal actually of this authorization server project is to be able to completely say we can remove this Spring Security Wealth project. 
so do, do you know why why it it, it was deprecated uh, that's that's a very good question no uh, i asked i i actually searched for this answer myself uh and it was from my point of view a very good project uh uh, I, I used it and I, I still see it used in a lot of, pro, a lot of project, a lot of commercial project for which I, I do consultancy. Um, but for some reason, they, uh, what, what they wanted to do was to bring all this functionality into Spring Security itself. And I think that what will happen in the end is that even this experimental authorization server will be actually part of Spring Security itself. So they, they don't want it to be a separate project. They want it to be everything in Spring Security so that you only have one project with everything related to the capabilities of uh, um, um, implementing the uh, application level security into your Spring Apps. Okay, sure. And that's basically the Zen board. So that's, we have no more issues for, uh, for uh, zero, 010. Zero, and you see that just a few are in progress now and a lot of them are, are already done. Uh, but um, yeah, um, so that, that means that soon uh, version 010 will be, will be released, which is the next one. Uh, but yeah, you can, you can, what I do and what I recommend you do as well, uh, I'm, I'm taking the project and I'm testing it. I, I read the RFC and then I'm testing it. And when I find the bug, I, I, I report the bug. You can actually, you can do it yourself. So you can, you can report the bug just going here, new issue. And you just have to, of course, detail what happened and uh, if possible, provide also some source code to reproduce the problem. And if you wish, you can, you can even solve it yourself because that's how open source is working. So we find bugs, we solve them, we contribute to, to, to specific projects. Um, and basically that's uh, what I have prepared for you for today. But of course, if you have any other questions, um, don't hesitate to ask them because uh, I'm, I'm happy to, to ask them now. But uh, by the way, I'm, I'm happy to ask them also to, to answer them. Uh, sorry, also afterwards. So if you if you have questions afterwards, you can anytime follow me on one of these three uh, social media: YouTube, Twitter, or LinkedIn, and um, you can ask me questions, and I will try to answer them as as much as I can, of course, because. Uh, like everybody else, I don't know everything, but I, I, I try to, to do my best. So what's so, the timeline of this project? So when, when would be the like a stable uh, one more release? Or very two? difficult, very difficult to say. My, in my experience, uh, in less than maybe one year and a half or two from the beginning of the project, I don't expect to have something stable. So. I would be very happy to have the experimental authorization server version one ready, uh, maybe this uh, fall, uh, like this fall, maybe fall of 2021, of course, or maybe even later. But it's just in my experience, so I, I don't, I don't have uh, a date or something planned that I know for sure that that will be it. That's how I see projects, and in my experience, something like that. Uh, it takes it takes more than one year and a half, um, uh, or maybe to 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 have a stable version. So, if if someone to implement an auth server today, uh, uh, would you still recommend to use Spring Security Auth two module, which is already deprecated? Yes. What what should they do? Yes, it, at the moment they you only have uh, two options. You either use a third party like Keycloak, Okta, or something similar, Auth zero, whatever that is. Uh, but if you really want to implement uh, your own, then the only way you can go in Spring, in a Spring world, is using Spring Security OAuth. So, and I've seen that. I've seen uh, projects starting uh, uh, this year uh, that started with Spring Security OAuth just because the customer uh, they wanted, they didn't want to use a third party. They didn't want to use Keycloak or Okta or something else. They wanted their own. So the only way to go is for the moment Spring Security OAuth. Yes. So th this also uh, deprecate all the like uh, like resource server configuration sites. Yes. yes. For okay. the resource server and the client, you already have an alternative. So you can directly use the Spring Security DSL method for that. Okay. Uh, so when when you will see, if you take a look here, uh, let's say you have a class, a configuration class. So project config. 
Uh, like in a normal project, you go here and you say extends web security configurer adapter. Uh, sorry, web security configurer adapter. And you, of course, have to override the configure method, which is this one of HTTP security. Then you can say something like this. And um, you have the auth to client, an auth to login and an auth to resource server through the DSL method, they are already working and you can use them. So that's what you, you should use in terms of client and resource server instead of, uh, of the Spring Security OAuth project if you are starting with uh, Spring Security now. And in Spring Security in action, I also provided um, some uh, details on how to, um, how to um, move your project from the Spring Security OAuth to Spring Security like leaving behind the Spring Security OAuth project and using these DSL methods instead. That's what you should use for the resource server and the client. Sure. Okay. I think uh, that's all the questions uh, we have. Uh, thank you very much. Yeah, uh, thanks. Thank you, uh, Lawrence, and for your uh, very informative session. And also, uh, thanks for taking all the questions. And uh, thanks a lot for uh, uh, thanks a lot everyone uh, uh, for joining, and uh, looking forward to meet you again in our next meetup. Uh, thank you very much. See you. Happy holidays. You too. Cheers. Bye.